Hello, all of you, I Survive readers, StoryWorks readers, all readers. It is day two of my I Survive Titanic read aloud, and it's so early in the morning that it is still dark, but I wanted to make sure that I got this read aloud in for you. And um, yesterday I read chapters one and two, and you know, it's been 10 years since I wrote this first I Survive book, which I really can't believe. And I was thinking to myself, why is the Titanic so fascinating? I want you to ask yourselves that. Like, why are we so interested in a ship that sank more than a hundred years ago? Um, and it's still one of the most pop. It's still one of my most popular books. It's still one of the most popular topics that anyone researches. And so that's a question I want you to think about. What about this story keeps its grip on our curiosity and our mind? So. That's what's going through my mind as I'm reading this book, and I want you to ask yourself that question. So by the way, I have to add that I am reading this because my beloved friends at Scholastic, who is my publisher, say it's okay for me to read my book to you right now on video. So here I go. Here is chapter three. If you haven't been catching up, go back and read the video right before. Chapter three. George didn't mean to get into trouble. It's just that he got these great ideas, like on their first day at sea when he had climbed up the huge ladder into the crow's nest. Aunt Daisy, he'd yelled, waving his arms. She'd looked up and she'd almost fainted. And yesterday, George had explored the entire ship. Aunt Daisy kept warning him that he'd get lost. She said the ship was like a maze, but George could always find his way even in the huge forest that stretched out behind their farm. Mama used to say that George had a map of the world behind his eyes. He saw the engine rooms and the boiler rooms and wound up on the third class recreation deck. He was watching some boys play marbles when he noticed that he wasn't alone. A little boy was staring up at him with huge eyes the color of amber glass. See, the boy said, see. He held up a postcard of the Statue of Liberty. He looked so proud, like he'd carved the big lady himself. George felt like he had to show something in return, so he took out his good luck charm, the Bowie knife, that the Bowie knife Papa had given him for his ninth birthday. He let the boy run his fingers across the handle, which was carved from an elk's antler. Enzo, the little boy said, chuffed puffing out his chest and pointing to himself. George, said George. Giorgio, the little boy cried with a smile. A man sitting near them laughed. He was reading an Italian English dictionary and had the same huge eyes as the boy. George guessed right that he was Enzo's father. Marco, he said, chasing, shaking George's hand, you are our first American friend. Marco must have been studying that dictionary pretty hard because George understood everything he said. George learned that Enzo was four years old. He'd lost his mama too. He and Marco came from a little town in Italy and now they were moving to New York City. Marco to George told Marco about their farm and their trip and explained that any decent person, person living in New York had to be a Giants fan. For some reason, Marco thought that was funny. When it was time for George to leave, Enzo got upset, very upset. Giorgio, he howled loud enough for the entire ship to hear. People stared and put their hands over their ears. Marco promised they'd see George again, but Enzo wouldn't quit howling. George had never heard anything so loud. By the time Enzo let, George, let go of George's leg and George ran back up to the suite, Aunt Daisy was practically howling too. I thought you fell overboard, she cried. But even then she wasn't really mad. She didn't get really mad until last night. How that lady screamed when George came sliding down the banister like he really was a giant squid. George didn't mind getting yelled at. He was used to it. Not a day at school had gone by without Mr. Lander shouting, George, settle down. And Papa, well, he always seemed to be mad at George, but not Aunt Daisy. And being on this trip was supposed to make her happy, happy for the first time since her husband died last year. It had been Uncle Cliff's dream to be on the maiden voyage of the Titanic. He'd struck it rich selling automobiles and had plenty of money to pay for one of the richest suites on the ship. When Uncle Cliff had his accident, George was sure Aunt Daisy would cancel this trip. 
Instead, she'd invited George and Phoebe to go with her. And to George's shock, Papa said they could. Your aunt's going on this trip to find a little peace, he'd said to George. I expect you to be a perfect gentleman. And if he wasn't, George knew he'd be shipped off to that army school for sure. Papa had been talking about that place ever since George had brought a two-foot rat snake to school to show Mr. Landers, because they were studying reptiles. George had been perfect the whole time in England. He'd let Aunt Daisy drag him to, fan to a fancy clothes store to buy a pair of boots. He even learned to drink tea without spitting it back into the cup. But well, the Titanic. The ship gave him so many great ideas, but now he'd really be perfect. No more ideas for the rest of the voyage. Chapter four. Phoebe wasn't taking any chances with George. I'm not letting you out of my sight, she announced after they finished breakfast. I'm your guardian angel. I didn't know angels wore spectacles, he'd said, tugging on one of Phoebe's curls. The smart ones do, Phoebe said, grabbing George's arm. She offered him a lemon drop from the little silver tin she'd been carrying around since London. George made a face. He hated those old lady candies. George wanted to go find Marco and Enzo and hear more about Italy. He wanted to ride the elevators up and down. Hardly any other ship in the world had elevators. Better yet, he wanted to find Mr. Andrews, the ship's designers. When Mr. Andrews had stopped by their table at dinner the first night, George thought he was just another boring millionaire coming over to kiss Aunt Daisy's hand. But Mr. Andrews was different. You built the Titanic, George, George had asked. Mr. Andrews smiled. Not by myself. It took thousands of men to build her, but I did design her. That's true. He invited George and Phoebe to come with him to the first-class writing room. He unrolled the ship's blueprints across a long, polished table. It was like looking at the skeleton of a giant beast. She's the big biggest moving object ever built, Mr. Andrews explained. Eleven stories tall, 45,000 tons of steel, and longer than four city blocks. Our aunt says nothing bad can happen to this ship, Phoebe says. People say it's unsinkable. No ship is safer, Mr. Andrews said. That is certainly true. What if the Titanic was hit by a meteor, said Phoebe, whose latest obsession was outer space. She was determined to see a shooting star before they docked in New York. Mr. Andrews didn't laugh or roll his eyes like Mr. Landers did when Phoebe asked her questions at school. I hadn't planned on any meteor meteors hitting the ship, Mr. Andrews said thoughtfully, but I'd like to think she could take almost anything and still float. Phoebe seemed satisfied. Are there any secret passages, said George? Here's a picture. Mr. Andrews studied the blueprints and then pointed to the boiler rooms. There are escape ladders, he said. They run up the starboard side of the ship, up two decks, through the stoker's quarters and into their dining hall. I hear the crew likes using them instead of stairs. George could have stayed there all night. He asked a million questions and Mr. Andrews answered every single one. I was like you when I was a boy, Mr. Andrews said just before Aunt Daisy came to haul George off to bed. One day, I predict, you will build a ship of your own. George knew that would never happen. He could barely get through a day of school, but he liked that in Mr. Andrews said it, and he, was sh he sure did want to find those secret ladders. But Phoebe had different ideas. First, she dragged George to the first class library so she could check out a book on Haley's Comet. Then she took him out on a walk on the boat deck. He felt like a dog. Strange, Phoebe said, looking at the lifeboats that hung just off the, sh the deck. There are only 16 boats. That's not nearly enough for everyone. The ship's unsinkable, George said. So do you really think we need lifeboats at all? Phoebe stared at the boats and shrugged. I guess you're right, she said. Then she announced that it was time to see how many ladies were wearing hats with blue feathers. George groaned. This would be the most boring day of his life. But at least nobody was yelling at him. So tomorrow I'm going to keep reading. But one thing I've noticed is that there's a lot of kind of hard words in my book. This was the first I Survived book I wrote, so I was writing them a little differently back then. So I think you might have some questions about some of the you know, vocabulary in the book. If you do, you can, you can ask your teacher or your mom or one of the people looking after you at home to post a question for me on Twitter or Facebook.
I'm very excited to hear from you. And I want you guys to have a wonderful day today. See you tomorrow.